Let's close our eyes to pray. Tell the Lord that this time the Lord will speak to your heart. That the word of God will have an impact upon your heart. And that God will give you the grace to be doers of the word. And the word of God will change us. In Jesus' name we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you very much for the good things we are doing in the life of everyone here. We know we are not going to be the same anymore. And we know that, Lord, every minister, every brother, every sister, as we are learning together, and you are putting your more, more of your grace and your love and your power and your passion into our hearts, will never be the same again in Jesus' name. Be glorified in every life. I will pray that, Lord, every ministry represented here, better things, greater things, higher things, will be hearing of one another after this Congress in Jesus' name. Just to be like you. Just to be like you. Blessed Redeemer, pure as you are. We're praying you'll come in your sweetness. You'll come in your fullness. You'll stamp your perfect image on every heart. Thank you, Lord, for doing it. In Jesus' name, we pray. God bless you. Please be seated. We come to the message concerning leaders at this time. And we're talking about the higher call, the refined, purified leader. And we're making use of the life and the ministry of Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 6, reading from verse 1. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon his throne high and lifted up, and his strength filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims, one each one had six wings, with twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another, and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said, I, woe is me, for I am undone. Because I am a man of unclean leaves, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean leaves, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken of the tongues from up the altar. And he, and he laid it upon my mouth, and said, Lo, this has touched thy lips. Thine iniquity is taken away, thy sin purged. As we look at this higher call of a refined and purified leader, and as I told you, we're looking at Isaiah in particular. And we're using Isaiah, and we're looking at what God has done for him, so we can see what God wants to do for us. Actually, Isaiah is regarded as the greatest of the Old Testament prophets. And it's one of the most eloquent writers that ever lived. Those who have read the text of the book of Isaiah in the original that he wrote it, they said that he appears to be a greater writer. The secular people have compared him to William Shakespeare. And they have said he's even a greater writer than that individual. And they have compared him with other secular writers. They said, as you look at the text, and you look at the composition, you are not even thinking of the inspiration now. They said he's a far greater, more eloquent speaker than all the rest of those people. He prophesied during the reign of five kings of Judah. And you'll find the mention of Uzziah and Joseph and Ahaz and Ezekiah and Manasseh. He was married and he had two sons. And Isaiah is quoted more times in the New Testament than any other Old Testament prophet. In fact, this book of Isaiah is very peculiar, as Isaiah himself is very peculiar. Think about it. The book of Isaiah has been compared to the whole Bible. The Bible has 66 books. Isaiah has 66 chapters. 
the Old Testament has 39 books. The fourth section of Isaiah has 39 chapters. The New Testament has 27 books. The last section of Isaiah has 27 chapters. The Old Testament covers the history and the scene of Israel. And chapters 1 to 39, the first part, first section of Isaiah, also covers the history and the scene of the people of Israel. The New Testament describes the person and the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the second section of Isaiah in the main also describes the person and the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. The New Testament begins with the ministry of John the Baptist. And you will see that the second section, chapters 40 to 66, that second section, beginning with Isaiah chapter 40, begins by predicting the ministry of John the Baptist. As you look at the New Testament, you will see that the central person and the central character of the whole of the New Testament is the Lord Jesus Christ. As you look at chapters 40 to 66, in chapters 40 to 66, you must do some counting with me now, you have 27 uh, chapters. And the middle chapter of those 27 uh, chapters will be... The position will be 14. You have 13 here, you have 13 here, and you have 14 in the middle. And if you have 14 in the middle, that 14, when you count, chapter 41, chapter 41, 2, chapter 42, 3, when you count, you're going to see that the middle chapter there is chapter 53. And that is the chapter that talks about the suffering, the sacrifice, the atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ. Which means the center of the New Testament is the Lord Jesus Christ. And the very center of the second part of Isaiah is also chapter 53, talking about the sacrifice and the atonement and the salvation that came through the Lord Jesus Christ. As you look at uh, the New Testament, the New Testament ends with the description of the new heavens and the new earth. As we come back to Isaiah, Isaiah ends his book by describing the new heavens and the new earth in the last chapter. That you'll find in Isaiah chapter 66 and in verse 22. You understand then that this Isaiah is peculiar. This Isaiah is very, very special. Even I've read it to you already. You see that Isaiah was cleansed, he was purged, he was purified, and he responded promptly to the call of God after his cleansing, after his refining, and after his purging. And you'll find that from that chapter, from chapter 7 now onwards, you'll find there's a change in his ministry. And you'll find he was uncompromising in proclaiming the word of God. In fact, the revelation that is given to Isaiah appears very, very full. And I challenge you, as a student of the Bible, and you go through Isaiah, just Isaiah, and you go from chapter 1, and you go to chapter 66, you are going to discover this, that the message of Isaiah covers, number one, the inspiration and the infallibility of God's word. Number two, it covers the power and the perfection of the Godhead, of God the Father, of God the Son. And it speaks much to you about the Holy Spirit. You're going to come find that Isaiah covers the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. You're going to discover that Isaiah speaks about the, sin, the sinfulness of man and the guilt of all men. He speaks about the necessity of repentance. Come and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, then they shall be white as snow. Before you do that, wash and make you clean and put the evil of your dreams from before mine eyes. Isaiah speaks of the mercy of God and the pardon and the salvation and the justification come he says and you seek the Lord while he may be found you call upon him while he's near let the wicked forsake his way and the righteous man is sought and let him come unto me and I will pardon him I will abundantly forgive him and as I speak it speaks about the power of righteousness and the grace for a change of life and do you know he speaks about restitution as well and then he speaks about purity of heart 
He speaks about sanctification. He speaks about holiness. As he said that the redeemed of the Lord, there is nothing unclean that will pass through that way. But those who are saved, those who are sanctified, the holy people of God, they will walk in that way. And though they be fair, where fearing men, there will be nothing unclean in them. He, this, he speaks about the prophet, the, the promise of the baptism and the power of the Holy Ghost. Of course, he talks about healing and he talks about the miracle, about the miracle ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me and has anointed me so that I'll preach the gospel to the poor and the opening of eyes uh, for the blind. He also speaks about the proclamation of the evangelistic message and the prediction of the, of the conversion of the Gentiles. How beautiful are the feet of them that publish the good tidings. He talks about the demonstration of godly marriage and he himself in his family. He had an exemplary family. He speaks about the lie and the message and the ministry of Christ, about the suffering, about the sacrifice, about the death of Christ, about the resurrection and the ascension and the exaltation of Christ. He speaks about the great tribulation. He speaks about Christ's millennial reign. He talks about the final judgment of all men and of all nations. He speaks about the new heavens and the new earth. He talks about everlasting punishment in hell, fire for repentant sinners. What a prophet is this, and what a ministry this prophet Isaiah had, a faithful prophet, a faithful preacher, that is Isaiah. That's why I'm inviting you to look with me into the book of Isaiah and see the ministry of Isaiah and see that he had this ministry after the Lord had touched him and transformed him and purged him and purified him and what the Lord has done for him he will do for every one of us in Jesus name as I look at this message I divide the message to three parts number one the heavenly call the heavenly call of the preaching prophet it wasn't just a visionary prophet it was a preaching prophet the heavenly call of the preaching prophet number two Humble confession and consecration before personal purity. Humble confession and consecration before personal purity. Number three, higher commission for the purified prophet. The, the, the fire from the altar of the Lord touched his leaves. And the angel declared, you are cleansed, you are purged, you are purified. And mark his ministry after that purifying. After the sanctification, you'll find he had a higher commission, a higher call, and a higher commitment in the ministry. Let's come back to point number one. The heavenly call of the preaching prophet. The call. The Lord actually calls each of us. And the Lord calls the prophets of the Old Testament. And he calls the preachers and the pastors and the leaders in the New Testament. In particular, he called Isaiah as well. In Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 1. It says, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and the high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. He's telling us here that there is an heavenly calling and that holy brethren are partakers of the heavenly calling i'm sure it's clear to you that first of all you'll become a member before you become a minister first of all you'll become a believer before you become a preacher first of all you'll become a son before you become the servant of the lord you'll become one of the holy brethren before you can be partakers of the heavenly calling. And it is not an earthly calling. It is an heavenly calling. And it is the Lord that has called us into the ministry. Then it tells us in Jeremiah chapter 7. You will see that in the Old Testament, those prophets of old, they were partakers of that heavenly calling. And the Lord called them. To represent him and to proclaim the word that he will give unto them. In Jeremiah chapter 7 verse 25. Since the day that your fathers came forth out of the land of Egypt. Unto this day I have even sent unto you 
all my servants, the prophets, daily rising up early and sending them. I sent them. And you will see then, as you think about these uh, people of the Old Testament, that the Lord himself sent out. They were partakers of that heavenly calling. And the Lord sent them to proclaim, to declare his mind, his word unto the people. How about Isaiah now? Isaiah himself. In Isaiah chapter 49. Isaiah chapter 49, verses 1 and 2. Listen, O house, unto me, and hearken ye people. From far, the Lord has called me from the womb, from the bowels of my mother, as he made mention of my name, and he has made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he has hid me, he hid me, and made me a polished shaft. In his quiver, he has hidden me. He has hid me. You will find then Isaiah giving his own testimony. And he said, of the prophets of the Old Covenant, of the Old Testament, I too, I was called. In fact, there's something peculiar about Isaiah. What is peculiar about him is that he, he wasn't the only one called in his family. He was called. His wife was called. And his children were also called. How wonderful for you, my brother. When you are called and your wife is called and your children are called. How, how wonderful for you, my dear sister. When you are called and your husband is called and then your children are also called. And you are together in the ministry. And you are doing good in the ministry. You are doing a part. Your wife is doing her part. Your children are doing their part. How wonderful it is. How wonderful it is that you, with all your strength, with all your power, with all your knowledge, with all your giftings, you are serving the Lord and your wife is not serving society and your wife is not just contributing to trade and commerce and your wife is not just building up university and education and sociology but your wife is also called like you how wonderful that daddy and mommy are called and the children they are not just laboring for the wind they are not laboring for the things the meat that will perish the children too they are contributing to something that will endure unto life eternal in isaiah chapter 8 isaiah chapter 8 reading from verse 1 moreover the lord said unto me Take thee a great roll and write in it with a man's pen concerning Mahashal al Hazbaz. And I took unto me faithful witness to record Uriah the priest and Zechariah, the son of Jebaziah. And I went unto the prophetess, and she conceived, that's his wife. She, he went, the prophet went to the prophetess, that's his wife, and she conceived and bare his son. Then said the Lord to me, Call his name Mahashal Hasbaz. For before the child shall have knowledge to cry, My father and my mother, the riches of Damascus and the spoil of Samaria shall be taken away before the king of Syria. He had another child making two children. Look at verse 18. Behold, I am the children whom the Lord has given me are for signs and for wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts which dwelleth in Mount Zion. He said, here is my testimony, here is my joy that the Lord called me for my mother's home. And then he said, even my wife, a prophetess. And then he said, my children too. Behold, the joy in our family, Isaiah said, I and the children whom the Lord has given me were for signs. Even the names of the children for signs in Israel. Even the names and the composition, the disposition of those children in the family, they are for signs, symbols, miracles, messages for the whole nation. And for wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts which dwelleth in Mount Zion. You see then that when the Lord chooses us, he makes us to really do something. 
and then we influence members of our family. If we cannot influence members of our families to work for the Lord and to serve the Lord, how can we influence members in the church to also serve the Lord and work for the Lord? I told you that this heavenly calling is for the preaching prophet, that Isaiah was not just a visionary prophet or even a writing prophet, he was a preaching prophet. To preach means to proclaim. To preach means to speak for. To prophesy is to predict. To speak of the future. And Isaiah did both. Preaching and prophesying. Proclaiming and predicting. Speaking forth and speaking of the future. By the power of the Spirit of God. He recalls historical revelations. And he also reveals eschatological revelations. On the part of historical details, he told Israel their history. On the part of eschatology, on the things to come, on the personalities to come, on the salvation to come, on the grace of God to come, he also revealed something that was eschatological. He was saved. And he was sent with a message of calling sinners and the sinful nation to repentance. Even before you come to the sixth chapter that I read to you. Look at this. In Isaiah chapter 1. Look at this preaching prophet. And see the way the ministry began. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 1. The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which is so concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, the kings of Judah. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. You, you see this, Isaiah, without any preamble, without any melodic introduction, he comes straight at them, speaking forth like an uncompromising preacher of the word, like an uncompromising prophet of the Lord. He said, the ox knoweth his owner, and the ass his master's grip. But Israel does not know, my people does not consider a sinful nation, a people lady with iniquity, a, a seed of evil doers, children that are corrupters, they have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They are gone away backward. That, that, that's the prophet. He was a preaching prophet, declaring the sin of Israel unto them. And then he comes to chapter 2. Look at it from verse 8. Isaiah chapter 2, reading from verse 8. Their land is full of, is full of idols. They worship the work of their own hands. And they will... That, that which their own fingers have made. The, the mean man bows now, and the great man humbles himself. Therefore, forgive them not. Enter into the rock, hide thee in the doors for the fear, for fear of the Lord, and for the glory of his majesty. The lofty looks of man shall be humbled, and the haughtiness of men shall be bowed down. The Lord alone shall be exalted in that day, for the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon every one that is proud and lofty, upon every one that lifted up, that is lifted up, and he shall be brought low. Don't you see that this is the kind of spirit we need? A bold spirit, a fearless spirit to confront sinners of their ways and to tell them, turn unto the Lord, that there is judgment against sin, any form of sin. Look at what it says in verse 22. Cease ye from man whose breath is in his nostrils, for wherein is he to be accounted of. By the time he comes to chapter 3, he has not stopped preaching. He's still preaching the same thing. He's a consistent preacher of righteousness and holiness of life. He was a consistent preacher calling the people to repentance, calling them to restitution, calling them to righteousness, calling them to real, righteous, right-standing relationship with the Lord. In chapter 3, listen to him. In chapter 3, verse 8, for Jerusalem is ruined. And Judah is falling because their tongue and their doings are against the Lord to provoke the eyes of his glory. The show of their countenance does witness against them. And they declare their sin as Sodom and they hide each not. 
warned to their soul, for they have rewarded evil unto themselves. Say ye to the righteous that it shall be well with him, for they shall eat the fruit of their own doings. Woe to the wicked, it shall be ill with him, for the reward of his hand shall be given him. As for my people, children are the oppressors. Women rule over them. Oh, my people, which they which lead thee, cause thee to hear and to err and to destroy the way of thy path. Can you see this? What, what, what a wonderful thing it will be if all the preachers in the land, you know, you hear, especially here in Nigeria, I don't know what it is in all the other countries, but here in Nigeria, at the end of the year, you will find that, uh, you know, there are prophets, self proclaimed, acclaimed prophets. And they're writing in the papers, they're speaking over the radio, they're speaking to everybody. And they're telling us, Nigeria, Nigeria, that this year it will be wonderful for everybody. There will be no crime. There will be no problem. There will be no poverty. God is sending them. He's sending all these prophets in our land to tell our people and to tell the leadership in politics and the leadership everywhere. God has said this year is declared as the year of joy for the sinners and joy for the nation and joy for everybody. And they are the prophets of the nation. What if these prophets will really get back into the word of God? What if these prophets will really get back into the might of the Lord and be bold enough to declare, thus says the Lord. Look at Isaiah in chapter 3. Isaiah chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 16 now. Isaiah is saying, moreover, says the Lord, because the daughters of Zion are haughty, and they walk with straight forth necks and wanton eyes, walking and mincing as they go, walking with a tinkling in their feet. I challenge you to find any of the prophets of the land at this time that will even address the appearance and the dressing of uh, the women, even in their own churches. And I challenge you to find prophets at this time in the nation that will challenge the worldliness in the city and will challenge uh, people are almost growing naked, even in the churches, in the Pentecostal, charismatic, evangelical churches. And the prophets are still saying everything is all right. The Lord is saying he's happy with his people. And the Lord is saying that things will be fine for everybody. Those are not prophets of God. In verse 17, therefore the Lord will smite with his crab, the crown of the head of the daughters of Zion. The Lord will discover their secret parts. In that day, the Lord will take away the bravery of their tinkling ornaments about their feet and their cords and the round tires like the moon, the chains and the bracelets and the mufflers and the bonnets and the ornaments of the legs and the headbands and the tablets and the earrings and the rings and the nose jewels, the changeable suits of apparel, the mantles and the wind and the scripting prints and the glasses and the fine linen and the hoods and the bales and it shall come to pass that instead of sweet smell there shall be stink instead of a gadoly rent instead of well set here baldness and instead of stomacher it says there shall be guarding of sackcloth burning instead of beauty and thy men shall fall by the sword and the mighty men in the war what a prophet what a prophet standing all alone Standing all alone. We don't read of another prophet that will encourage him, that will be bold as he was bold. But the point is, this was a prophet that knew the Lord. And this was a prophet calling the people to repentance, telling them that God is a pure God and God is a righteous God. And it was righteousness in chapter 4 verse 1. It says, and in that day seven women shall take hold of one man, saying, we will eat our own bread and wear our own apparel. Only let us be called by thy name to take away our reproach. Follow him to chapter 5. In chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 11. One to them that rise up early in the morning, that they may follow strong drink, that continue until night, till wine inflame them. What a prophet. What a prophet. He will not allow a drunkard to be in his uh, work team in the church. He will not allow a, a drunkard or somebody producing alcohol for the rest of the drunkards to be drinking. He will not allow them and give them a conspicuous place in his church, in his assembly. 
he'll send him to the mourner's bench and he will say go and repent because there is a woe declared upon you and then he says in verse 12 the harp and the bill and the tablet and the pipe and the wine are in their fields but they regard not the work of the Lord neither consider the oppression of his hands therefore my people are gone into captivity because they have no knowledge and their honorable men are famished and their multitude dried up well sirs as he speaks to the lowly he speaks to the highly placed and he wasn't pitching them and he wasn't uh, trying to cover up anything he was telling them the truth as the truth was in verse 14 therefore hell has enlarged herself and opened her mouth with without measure and their glory and the more and their multitude and their pomp and he that rejoices shall descend into it into hell and the mean man shall be brought down and the mighty man shall be humbled and the eyes of the lofty shall be humbled and then he says, But the Lord of all shall be exalted in judgment, and God is holy, and God that is holy shall be sanctified, glorified, magnified in righteousness. Then shall the lambs feed after their manner, and the waste places of the fat ones shall strangers eat. Woe unto them that draw iniquity with cords of vanity, and sin as it were with a cattle that say, Let him make speech and hasten his work, that we may see it, the people that mourn, the people that jest, the people that joke, what the word and the judgment of God, he says one to them, and they say, let the counsel of the Holy One of Israel don't near and come, that we may know it, one to them, that call evil good, and good evil, that put darkness for light, and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet, and sweet for bitter, one to them, that are wise in their own eyes, and prudent in their own sight, one to them that are mighty to drink wine, the men of strength to mingle strong drink, which justify the wicked for reward and take away the righteousness of the righteous from him. Therefore, as the fire devoured the stubble and the flame consumed the chaff, so their root shall be as rottenness and their blossom shall go up as dust because they have cast away the law of the Lord of hosts and then they have despised the word of the Holy One of Israel therefore is the anger of the Lord kindled against his people and he has stretched forth his hand against them he has meeting them the hills they tremble and their carcasses were torn in the midst of the street for all this his anger is not turned away but his hand is stretched out still this was a prophet and this is what prophets ought to be. The people that have the heavenly calling and they exercise their ministry and they do the right thing and they say the right thing. If they are truly representing God, they will be the conscience of the nation. And you, as ministers of God, as prophets of the Most High God, as the one that is enjoying the privilege of the heavenly calling, anywhere you are ministering, anywhere you are going, you will not be intimidated. You will not be afraid. You will be bold. You will be fearless, declaring the very mind of God and calling sinners to repentance. And was he just, you know, telling them about their sin? What was he? He was calling them to repentance. Look at it in chapter 1 and in verse 15. It tells them, chapter 1, verse 15, when you spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when ye make many prayers, I will not hear your hands are full of blood wash you make you clean put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes cease to do evil learn to do well and seek judgment as justice relieve the oppressed and judge the fatherless plead for the widows come now and let us reason together says the lord though your sins be as scarlet they shall be as white as snow though they be red like crimson they shall be as white as wool if ye be willing and obedient ye shall eat the good of the land what a wonderful thing you have told us, Isaac. Oh, I'm only telling those who repent because in verse 20, but if ye refuse and rebel according to your nature, according to what you always do, Israel, ye shall be devoured with the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. I pray that God will raise up Isaiah among us. 
the people that can declare the word of God without fear and without favor, that will be able to say, thus says the Lord. This is the might of the Lord, and this is what the Lord is calling the nation to. And this is what the Lord is calling the people to, and the people in the church. What a wonderful thing. If you will have this evangelistic approach in your meeting, that on Sunday, or maybe on other days in the program, you're giving altar calls. Sinners are always there. You're preaching to them, and you're telling them of the need to repent. You're telling them of the need for a righteous life. Righteousness in the family. Righteousness in the working place. Righteousness in the society. Righteousness everywhere we find ourselves. And then after that you are making the altar call and you are telling them come now. Let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, I'll make them as white as snow. And though they be as crimson, they will be as white as wool. You tell them of the atonement of Christ. You tell them of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And you tell them of the cleansing power of the blood of the Lamb that is able to make them as white as snow. In fact, whiter than snow. Point number two, humble confession and consecration before personal purity. Humble confession and, pers and consecration before personal purity. We come now to chapter 6 again, Isaiah chapter 6. And he tells us himself the story of how he came face to face with the goodness of the Lord. He came face to face with the challenge of not just preaching holiness, not just preaching righteousness, but possessing that holiness and possessing that righteousness. In Isaiah chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon his throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. What a wonderful thing. You come to the house of God. You don't only see the preacher. You don't only see the men and the women. You see the Lord himself. Because if you come to the auditorium, if you come to the sanctuary, if you come to the temple and you do not see the Lord, the glory of the Lord, the majesty of the Lord, the revelation of the, who the Lord is, if you do not have in your mind's eye revealed to your heart who the Lord is, you'll be coming and you'll be going. You'll be coming and you'll be going. And nothing spectacular and nothing definite will happen. There will not be a break. There will not be a point of demarcation, a line of demarcation in your ministry. At the moment you'll say, it was in a particular day like this, at a particular program like this, I came to the house of the Lord and I saw the glory of God and the holiness of God and the majesty of God and the beauty of the holiness in a sanctuary in a way I never saw it before. And then since that time, something happened to me. I've never been the same again. That's exactly what Isaiah is telling us. Above it stood the seraphims, each one had six wings, with twain he covered his face, because they will not be so familiar with the glory of God. Those angels had to cover their faces, and with twain he covered his feet. They must be careful about the movement and the actions and the motion of their feet. Even before the Lord, and with twain he did cover his feet, and with twain he did fly, to be very sweet in obeying the Lord and running errands for the Lord. That's why he had those two wings now to fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Although Israel cannot see and Israel has not partaken of that glory, the fullness of glory, yet the whole earth, Israel included, Africa included, every continent included, everyone, every continent, every country full of the glory of the Lord. And it is the preacher, it is the minister. It is the ambassador of Christ. It is the representative of the Lord saying to all these places that are to reveal that glory unto the nations, unto the people. And then he says, and the post of the door moved that the voice of him that cried. And the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, woe is me. You know, he had been a preacher himself and there was no outward sin in him. 
And you know how he condemned the drunkards and the liars and the deceivers and the hypocrites and the people that called good evil and they called evil good and the pretenders and the people that had just lip service and religion worship, how he condemned them. And you will see that this was a minister that outwardly, externally, everything appeared to be all right. But now when he saw the beauty of the holiness of God, the majesty and the glory of God, he said, comparing myself with the holiness I see, comparing the righteousness I have with the righteousness I behold now, comparing the holiness I have that made me to be able to declare something against the sin of Israel from chapter 1 all through to chapter 5 as I compare the holiness I possess with the holiness I see now, the bright, immaculate, white beauty, bright glory of the Lord. I can only say, woe is me. I see myself as I'm not qualified to even stand before the Almighty God. And if this is so here on earth, I've not gone into heaven yet. If I can see a vision, a revelation of the glory, of the majesty, of the holiness of God here on earth, just in a vision, and I feel inadequate, and I feel unacceptable, and I feel unholy, and I feel that I'm so far away from the holiness of God here on earth, just looking at a vision. What will happen if I were to go to heaven and see it in reality, the bright, unshaded glory and beauty of the holiness of God. That's why he said, now, there is still the possibility of a change. And he cried unto the Lord in humble confession and in consecration. Woe is me because of my condition that I find. And that's exactly what the Lord is expecting from every one of us. That you'll be able to cry out to the Lord when you come into a sanctuary like this. You come into a meeting like this. And you hear what you hear. And you see what you see. And you feel what you feel. There should be something out of your heart. Listen, you're a minister. A minister of the gospel. And no doubt, you'll be ministering where you came from. But now you come and you see the glory and the majesty of the Lord. And then you are crying out from the very depth of your heart. You are saying, oh Lord, I hear. I see. I feel. I sense it. And there is something stirring up within me that the level I have got before I came into the sanctuary, I thought I was all right. I thought everything was okay. But now that I've come and I've seen what I've seen, I need more of your purity and more of your holiness and more of your righteousness and more of that sanctifying, purifying, refining fire, taking from the altar of the Lord and touching my heart and touching my lips and touching the very fountain of my life. That's what Isaiah did and that's what the Lord is calling upon you and calling upon me, calling upon everyone to do. It tells so all seen in uh, Second Timothy, in Second Timothy, reading from chapter two, chapter two, verse nineteen. Second Timothy, chapter two, verse nineteen. Here it says, "Nevertheless, the foundation of God stands sure, having this seal: the Lord knoweth them that are His, and let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity." Now, if uh, we really want to be used of the Lord, like, you know, this Isaiah, I told you in the introduction about the book of Isaiah and the comparison of that book or the whole Bible, and you will see the fullness of ministry. You will see the impact of his ministry. You will see the power in his ministry. You will see the inspiration of the Holy Ghost in his ministry. And if there is going to be a change, in this country, Nigeria, if there's going to be a change in the countries you represent, the countries you come from, it is going to come through people like you and like me. The people that are seeing afresh the glory of God and the majesty of God. And the people that are saying, oh God, I thought I was a minister already accomplished, already full, already doing what I ought to do. I see another dimension. I see another area and I'm yielding myself. I'm surrendering myself that I, by your grace, in your strength, in your power, I will go back to my country. I will go back to where I came from and I will make a change if that is going to take place. Let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity but in a great house. 
there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Flee also youthful lusts. You want to be used of God? Flee youthful lusts. You want to actually be an instrument in the hand of God, a change agent, an agent, a tool of transformation in your country, in your locality, in your community. Flee youthful laws, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the name of the Lord, on the Lord, out of a pure heart. And that's what the Lord is calling us to. He's calling us to a purging. Do you see what happened to Isaiah? Thy sin is taken away. And your iniquity is purged. Sin purged, sin taken away. Iniquity purged and taken away. And that's exactly what the blood of Jesus Christ does for us under the new covenant. In, a, in Hebrews chapter 9, Hebrews chapter 9, reading from verse 13. For if the blood of bulls under the old covenant, and of goats under the old testament, and, of, and the ashes of an ephah, uh, sprinkling, um, sprinkling the unclean, sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, if it did that in the old covenant under the old testament, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And there is a purging that takes place. As you, as you come to the Lord, there is a purifying that takes place as you come to the Lord. In fact, in the Old Testament, the Lord, looking forward to the time in which we live, had already given this promise in anticipation of what he was going to do for you and for me in the days and the age in which we're living. In Ezekiel chapter 36, Ezekiel chapter 36, I'm reading to you from verse 25 and verse 26. Ezekiel 36, 25, then it's referring to a particular time. It's referring to a particular age and a particular era. It's referring to a particular time, dispensation that will come. That's the time now. Then when I sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean. From all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. And then in verse 26, a new heart also will I give you. And a new spirit will I put within you. I believe the Lord has done it for many of us. And the Lord will still do more than this for every one of us. In verse 26, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. And I will give you an heart of flesh. Wonderful thing. Oh, but you say the Lord has done that for me already. Thank God he has done that for you already as a believer. As a believer. As a minister. You know, this ministry, as you're a minister. And the Lord says, now, I'm going to take away the stony heart out of your flesh. You need to understand, we ministers, sometimes we think we know everything. And we know we can do everything. And we can plan everything. Sometimes we ministers, we can plan for the whole year. This program and this program and this program. And we don't pray about it. We just know that the Lord has given me sanctified common sense. And I know what to do to move the church ahead. And we just see now. And we just write this, this, this and this. And if we have the ministerial stony heart, we keep to that thing. January, this is what to do. February, this is what to do. And March, this is what to do. And April, this is what to do. When I come to May and June and July, this is what to do. And when I come to August, now you know this is what to do. It's reaching now already. And if the Holy Ghost says, I want to bring revival. And I want to bring fire coming from heaven to do something spectacular, something wonderful. And we need to cancel this thing that you are putting here so that we can replace it. So that my spirit and my power and the revelation of the Lord can do something dynamic that is not on your paper. Say, no, I'm sorry. Holy Ghost, you came too late. I, I, I made all my resolutions and all my programs. I tidied up everything on, in January. Why didn't you come at that time? Why are you just coming now? I want to disorganize my program. I'm not going to allow that. 
at Holy Ghost, come next year. And then I will give you a chance when I'm planning it in January. And then you come with that idea. I will have a place to fix your program. But now, I'm sorry, everything is full. There is a stony heart in the minister that will not change, that is so rigid. It is so like this. It must remain like that. I'm not going to give the Holy Ghost chance to bring any revival or to bring any transformation because he has not gone back to the Lord. Thank God you are sanctified when it comes to character, when it comes to behavior, when it comes to your lifestyle, when it comes to the normal, regular experience. I'm saved. I'm sanctified. I'm filled with the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues. But as a minister of the Lord, that the Lord is saying, let me bring the fire of heaven upon you. Let me purge you so that you will say not just what you want to say, but what I want you to say, you will do. Not just what you want to do, but what I want you to do. And I will take the stony heart out of your flesh that makes you to feel that you planned your program. You know what to do. You know where to go. You know how to get the results. You know the methods and the strategies. You have read enough. You are not a novice in the service of the Lord. Give me chance and I will turn everything around and then I will put my spirit within you. It will be a new heart. You'll be so sensitive to the touch of the spirit. You'll be, you'll be so sensitive to the power of the Holy Ghost in your life. In fact, he follows after by telling us in verse 27 right there, after he has done that and has given you the heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments and do them, and ye shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, and ye shall be my people, and I will be your God. May God confirm that in your ministry in Jesus' name. You see, I say, I saw the glory of God, and he saw the spotless beauty and holiness of the Lord. Though he had been saved, and he had been righteous before this, I mean, in fact, more righteous than, sinful, than the sinful nation to whom the Lord had sent him and then be preaching repentance to them. And his outward righteousness faded into nothingness in comparison with God's holiness and God's glory. He saw his need of inner cleansing. And he saw his need of heart holiness. He was under conviction. And he cried out for God's purifying, purging, sanctifying, refining touch. He was purified, refined, purged, and sanctified. Revelation, the revelation of God's holiness. The conviction of personal need. The realization of God's requirement of heart holiness. The desire, the consecration, and the prayer of faith will be necessary before this divine operation that brings sanctification, real sanctification, thorough sanctification, entire sanctification, minister's sanctification before that can be effected in any of us. I come to point number three. The higher commission of the purified prophet. Higher commission for the purified prophet. Now it's been purified. He had been purged. And as you look at him again in Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah chapter 6, in verse 7, and he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this has touched thy lips. Thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin, singular, when it says sins in the plural, uh, those are the transgressions. Those are the wrong deeds. Those are the uh, various areas of blemish in character. Outward expressions of doing evil. But this one is a root. This one is original sin. This one is inbred sin. This one is the very nature of it. And thy sin purge. Also, I had the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? And who shall go? Who will go for us? Suppose you were. And you were there. And the Lord said, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Maybe you will not answer. And maybe you, are not, you will not be doing that out of spite, out of rebellion. No. You are just doing that because you know you must be calling other people. I'm called already. I'm sent already. I'm not a new preacher. 
I started preaching. Did you read my message in chapter 1? Did you hear what I told those people in chapter 2? Did you see what I told those, weak, those uh, worldly women in chapter 3? Did you hear my prophecy in chapter 4? And those drunkards and lofty, highly placed people, did you see how I came bold and strong against them in chapter 5? Whom shall I say? I think he's calling that brother there. He's been dragging his feet. I think he's calling that sister there. She's been dragging her feet. I think he's talking to those people there who have not been responding to the call of God as for me am I not a prophet, a preacher already? But Isaiah was not going to take anything for granted. I'm hearing the call again. And it's the call to higher service. And even though I've done something before, I'm going to come to the Lord today. I'm going to respond to the call today as if I am just starting today. Those are the people God can deal with. Those are the people God can actually send forth to do something spectacular and something different and something marvelous and something that is so different from what you have ever done in this age and this generation. I pray you will respond to the Lord. I said you will respond to the Lord. Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then said I. Before I tell you what is said, have you noticed that there are some people, it depends on the time of the day when the Lord is calling them. And I've been watching, and I, you know how much I love you, and you know I, yes, I cannot criticize you. And I, I don't want to do that, and I cannot do that, because we're ministers together, and I love you as you know, leaders working as a team together. But I'm just telling you what I've observed, that in the morning, the way we pray, it's like if the call of God came to us early in the morning, the way we pray, there is fire in our prayer. There is zeal in our prayer. There is commitment in our prayer. Heaven can shake and the pillars of the earth can shake in the morning if the, if the Lord called us in the morning. And then as the day runs on, and then we come to midday, if we hear the call of God, midday is unfortunate for the majority of us because we're not used to praying midday, afternoon. That's the tired, weary part of the day for most of us. I see that in the general retreat. I see that in the workers' retreat. I see that at the Congress. But I'm appealing to you because God wants to take you as an instrument in this nation and in your nation. An instrument that will make a change. An instrument that will make a transformation. That you will go out in the fire and the power of the Spirit of God and you will make a change in the places you came from in Jesus' name. That's the reason why our response, whether it is midday or afternoon or evening, ought to be that like that of Isaiah. Then said I, here am I, send me. Can I hear that from you? Here am I. Say, like, say it like it's early in the morning. Say it like you are not hungry. Can you stand up for a moment? I've not finished yet. You'll say this because the Lord is asking you now, Whom shall I send and who shall go for us? Then said I, In this country, here am I. In your country where you come from. My dear sisters, only now I want to hear your voice. Women have some things to do in this generation, in this hour, at this time that men cannot do. You have a special ministry. Where are you? Uh, what are you going to do? Here am I. Say that again, my dear sisters. The younger generation in this age, to the children and to the youth, they are waiting for us. And I'm wanting all those who are working with the children, and you are working with the youth, and you are working with the campus, the campus. Look at the condition of the campus, my brother, my sister. And look at the condition of the youth that are roaming about in the streets. And God says he loves them. And he wants to send some people that have dynamite and love and power and might and fearlessness and 
boldness and conviction. He wants to send them in the midst of the children and in the midst of the youth and in the midst of the adults and in the midst of the campus people. Are you there? All those workers among children and youth and campus, here am I. Let me hear you. Pastors of churches, you know what the conditions are. You know what the villages look like. And you know the idolatry. And you know the corruption. And you know the deception of the various churches rising up. Evangelical churches and Pentecostal churches and charismatic churches. You read in the papers and you read where the majority of people are going. All they're looking for, they're looking for healing. They're looking for prosperity. Nobody is talking about salvation. And even deeper life, if we're not careful, well, we will flow with them. It will be like only talking about healing, only talking about deliverance. When are they going to get saved? All the people in these various communities, when will the power of God grab them and will turn them around? There will be repentance and there will be regeneration and there will be conversion. There will be righteousness. And the Spirit of God will so grab the sinner that the things I used to do, I don't want to do them anymore. Where are the ministers and where are the pastors that will yield themselves to the Lord and they will say as the Lord is calling them are we in agreement everybody every brother every sister wherever you are walking whatever you are preaching wherever you are preaching that's what I mean whatever location you are and whatever country you are yeah that you will go out of this conference you will go with the fire and with the conviction bold fearless because the day has come when the preacher will not be afraid of the people we're preaching to and you'll not be afraid of those people of the world the lord is looking for people with conviction the people that have fire within them that the years you have ahead of you now look at isaiah he had been preaching before but then the lord now said whom shall i send and who will go for us and thank god for isaiah i said thank god for isaiah how would we have been able to have chapter 7 if I said did not say here am I? How would we have been able to hear, behold, a child is born, and behold, a son is given unto us, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. How shall we be able to hear in chapter 7 if Isaiah did not respond in chapter 6? How shall we be able to hear, behold, a virgin shall conceive and shall be with son, and then his name shall be called Emmanuel, God be with us. How shall we be able to hear that the Gentiles and the people that dwell in the very shadow of death and in darkness light has come up for them except that Isaiah responded and he said here am I, send me. That's why I'm calling upon everybody here that with your blood and with your life and with your zeal and with everything you have and with your voice and with all the strength within you, you will tell the Lord that today, today the Lord will set you on fire. The fire of God in your bone. The fire of God in your heart. The fire of God on your tongue. And the fire of God in your eyes. And with your hands stretched, set up. Can you stretch your hand to the Lord? You are telling the Lord, Here am I. Here am I. Here am I. Send me. No matter where it is, where the witches are having their meetings, send me there. Where the occultic people are, send me there. Where those women are worldly, send me there. Where those churches are having their conventions, send me there. Where they're making gems of holiness and righteousness, send me there. Where they're not serious about the gospel, send me there. In my state, in my region, where the fire of God, in my country, I want to do something new. I want to really serve you the rest of my life, the weeks of my life, the months of my life, the years of my life, every day, every moment, I will not be lazy. I will not be indolent among the children, among the youth, among the campus people, among the women, among the church people, among members of deeper life, outside deeper life, every day, anywhere I go, oh Lord, I surrender myself to you. And I'm telling you, I want this higher commission. I receive this higher commission. I embrace this higher commission. Lord, I will not look back anymore. I will not tremble anymore. I will not shake anymore. I will not be timid anymore. I will not be fearful anymore. I will not be cringing anymore. I will not be compromising anymore. Lord, I am telling you, here am I. Send me. 
Here am I. Send me. Here am I. Send me. The Lord is calling you. Surrender to the Lord. Consecrate afresh to the Lord. Here am I. Send me. In Jesus' name we pray. Oh Lord, but start with me. Jesus, begin with me. Who oh, will go for you, Lord? Who oh, will go for you, Lord? Here I am, Lord. Send me. Send me, Lord. Send me. Oh, Lord, but start. Start with me. 